Welcome back, everyone. It's Thursday, October 15th, and we are officially at the halfway mark for this course. We thought that this might be an important moment to reflect for all of us here. We have three phenomenal speakers who we'll be introducing shortly. Um, I'm sure many are known to you. Um, they have come to represent in many ways some of the most critical discourse um, in this moment. Um, in terms of their writing and speaking on these matters. And I think it's also important to recognize that we're at an important inflection moment, both in this country and also globally in terms of the pandemic. As cases are continuing to rise and many people are considering that we're entering perhaps a third wave in this pandemic in the US right now. And so even though many of us have felt that there's a a time where we would like to be re-entering in a way, as people have discussed, we're also very much still part of this COVID moment that we're sharing together. And in discussing this course, um, Alan and I and a small group of people, we started planning this um, pretty soon after we realized that this was going to be a global pandemic. And so when we were, we were conceptualizing the arc of this course, it was really clear to us that we wanted to have one session devoted to something that we felt might be an icon for this moment. And so we discussed the importance of masks and little did we realize back in April or May how critically important masks would become as part of this national discussion and what a political flashpoint it would be. For many, we'll have a discussion today throughout history, masks have been important aspects of public health response. And we can see here that this moment has moved masks into a different place. And when we discuss uh, the future in terms of what images we might consider seeing, certainly the discussion of masks will have to be an important, and the, the concept of the mask will be an important image that we'll want to consider. So on that note, we would like to put up some poll questions for you all today to um, answer, if we can pull those forward, Ivan. So the first question, in my use of masks, I am highly compliant, moderately. So this is a self-reflection of how compliant you would consider yourself. And then the second question is, should there be a national mandatory mask? So the first question is obviously a self-reflective question and um, it's completely anonymous, um, that most of you would character, characterize yourselves as highly compliant. And interestingly, almost the same percentage felt that there should be a national mandatory mask policy. So I think um, these are really important questions. Um, I think some of these will come up, certainly either in the discussion or in the Q&A afterwards. I think we're going to have some provocative discussions. I, I hope we will. Um, and again, I'll, I'll hand it over to Alan to introduce our wonderful speakers. Thanks, Ingrid. I, I've really been looking forward to today's session. And as a historian of medicine and public health, I've been interested in masks for a long time, when they're used, how effective they are, what they're made of. And so as we were planning this session, I had this one thought about a course that had been traditionally taught at Harvard. The professor recently retired. Her name is Laurel Ulrich. And she gave a course in the Gen Ed curriculum on what was, the course was called Tangible Things. And she asked all of the students to find something in the Harvard collections, an object, and then write about it. And the idea was you take this tangible thing, um, you know, it could be a clock, it could be, you know, some other implement, um, it could be a glass flower. But then you would ask, who made this? What did it mean? Um, when was it made? What were the materials? What does it reflect about society and culture at that particular moment in time in which it was made? And I found myself thinking about masks in that way. And that a mask can mean one thing at one time, and another thing at another, but that masks have become almost the distilled essential symbol of the 
COVID pandemic, especially here in the United States. So we wanted to bring some people who really could help us think those issues through. Um, when I woke up this morning, I, I said to myself, what would, a, what would a cloud, a word cloud around mass look like today? And it would be everything from, you know, science and public health, communication and misinformation, symbol, ideology, anger. We can see maybe later in the course, what later in the class, what some of those terms that have dominated this discussion um, might be. But we really have three exceptional um, scholars and practitioners with us today. And so let me introduce them quickly. I can't, all of them are so distinguished that it would take this full session, but let me just say the first speaker will be my colleague, Hannah Marcus from the Department of the History of Science. And Hannah is an expert on early modern history. Um, she's written a brilliant new book that just came out literally weeks ago, um, and I just want to make sure I get the title right, Forbidden Knowledge, Medicine, Science, and Censorship in Early Modern Italy. It's a remarkable story of how the church censored a wide variety of medical writings and then the circulation of those writings among professionals and others um, following their censorship and where and how the books turned up. Hannah's really a, a remarkable scholar. And in this last six months, she's written a series of essays that are able to relate deeper history to the experience and meaning of COVID-19. And so we were really eager to get her here today. The second speaker um, this morning is Dr. Atul Gawande. Dr. Gawande is probably known to almost all of you um, because of his remarkable and brilliant writing in The New Yorker. And I think for so many of us, like, I just wait for my New Yorker and like when there's an article by Dr. Gawande, everything else stops and I read that first. And um, he not only is a brilliant medical writer and there's a deep tradition of physicians who write, but an incredibly, you know, a thoughtful and brilliant analyst of the current dilemmas of our modern healthcare system. And he founded a laboratory at the Harvard School of Public Health, the Ariadne Labs, that's looking at, at innovations in health systems. He's been an incredible advocate for surgical safety all around the world. And of course, he's best known for his books, um, which I have often assigned. Um, I would just mention that anyone who hasn't read um, Being Mortal, Medicine and What Matters in the End um, has really missed something that could have a major impact on their and their families' lives, but it has a much deeper set of thoughts about where we are in modern medicine and how medicine can serve patients better. Um, so it's wonderful to have you here today. And finally, um, our third speaker will be Dr. Julia Marcus, who's an epidemiologist at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and at Harvard Medical School. And Dr. Marcus has devoted much of her career to looking at aspects of care and harm reduction um, for HIV especially in the realm of what's come to be called pre-exposure prophylaxis. And it's really a remarkable story in the history of AIDS that drugs were developed that can really protect people at risk from the course of AIDS infection and pathology. And she's done really critical work in that area. And recently she has taken insights from that earlier work on harm reduction and turned it to COVID-19, thinking about how we can reduce the potential harms 
prevent COVID-19. And she's written extensively about masks and mask culture. Um, so it's really great to welcome you here today. So we'll start now with Professor Marcus, not to be confused with Dr. Marcus. And so far as we have been able to determine, no relationship. But um, Professor Hannah Marcus will start. Wonderful, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be sharing the floor with, well, floor with such wonderful speakers today. All right, I've got some images for you all. Um, Alan, you're top of my screen. Can I get a thumbs up that you can see this okay? Got it. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so I put together a few images on plague doctors and their clothes sort of between 1500 and 1750. And it's maybe worth um, mentioning the periodization just briefly. So I'm studying someone who studies the 15th to 17th centuries in particular. My research is mostly in Italy, so a lot of the images that we'll talk about are from that period. You might have talked about the Black Death a tiny bit over the course of this class, so like a major public health, global public health crisis. Um, uh, we know the sort of mortality figures from 1347 uh, to 51 and, and that major outbreak of, of plague. Uh, they killed about a, a third to a half of the European population, but plague then became endemic in Europe, um, as well as in other places in the globe and resurfaced regularly in these um, outbreaks that killed huge portions of the population. As part of that, uh, there come to be doctors who are uh, tasked with treating people during outbreaks of plague. So I'm, I'm looking particularly at the period that I study, 1500 to 1750, which includes one of the major last major outbreaks in Europe, not the last, but one of the last major outbreaks in Europe in 1720 in Marseille. Um, so I do a lot of research in Italy. I wanted to start with the fact that like plague masks are something that might be quite familiar to you. If you've been to Venice, you've seen these masks um, for sale on basically every street corner. Um, they get a little bit fanciful. I guarantee that they did not have huge feathery uh, components like you see in the top right there. Um, but there's this idea of like dressing up as the plague doctor as something that's like inherently horrifying. And that's something that I want to like toy with a little bit is like what the emotional registers of, of these masks, of these outfits are and what those communicate while also treating them as material objects that had sort of particular protective purposes in this period. So, excuse me, there we go. Uh, I'm calling these next couple of slides before the beak um, because the, the beak that you see here, right? The, the classic plague mask that has the long beak uh, is sort of a 17th century invention, which isn't to say that people didn't take any precautions when dealing with plague, that physicians didn't take any precautions dealing with plague before the beak was invented. Uh, so it's worth just talking through a few of those examples. And I think one of the things that I think that's been very interesting to me is I've been rereading a bunch of this literature during this outbreak is thinking about distancing. Um, so I've, I've compiled a few different examples from primary source documents for you um, from the, these ones are from the 17th century in particular. So examples of court questioning where the court notes that they keep the witness at a distance of eight arm lengths or another court out, um, court case, and these are actually court cases where they're trying people who are accused of breaking quarantine, of getting treated by people they shouldn't be treated by, of admitting um, prostitutes into the plague house. It, there, there's all sorts of things that people are up to that they shouldn't be. So another questioning, um, again, from a distance where a sworn statement is given to somebody by a stick that's four arm lengths long, right? They like poke the statement onto the stick and help hold it out so that people can sign it. Sanitary personnel, the people who went through the cities collecting corpses, uh, had bells on their ankles so that people could know that they were coming ahead of time. So they're the auditory signs. Um, and then a physician who gets in trouble um, and is put on trial, writes about how, um, or testifies that others of his profession keep so far away from him that he can scarcely even hear their words, that like his, his ability to communicate with their physicians during this outbreak of plague in 16, this one's 1630, um, that he can barely hear them, they're keeping their distance so far, and that they're laden with herbs and sponges and vinegar. And I wanna come back to these a little bit, like why the herbs, why the sponges, why the vinegar, but that has to do with the beak. So we're gonna get to that in one moment. Before the beak, part two, um, again, I want to point out that there were sort of 
there were costumes that people or, or clothes, protective clothing that people were using, that physicians were using in general, even before this iconic beak came into use. And one example is, is waxed cloth. And that's because the way that people understood um, uh, disease transmission, like miasma theory, is that they thought that um, these bad smells that they were smelling were causing disease, which isn't entirely bad thinking, right? Like if you smell your chicken before you eat it and it smells really weird, that's like a good sign that you shouldn't eat it. So there's some like reasons that people um, had these theories, held these theories, even if we don't understand diseases um, being transmitted in the same ways now. So uh, they're trying to manage smells and they're trying to manage what they think of as like substances sticking to you. And so physicians would wear, and even priests who would go to administer sacraments to people who had plague would wear waxed cloth. So cloth that's got wax rubbed into it so that the disease would slide off of them. It was less likely to stick. They wanted people to shave their beards so that it wasn't gonna uh, stick to their faces. Um, additionally, there are examples of people using lenses even before this like full outfit, this full sort of early modern hazmat suit. Um, a barber surgeon named Coveri in the 17th century, it, folks write about him as having examined his patients with the glasses of Galileo, right? This is amazing. This is a plague outbreak that Galileo was living through. It's an interesting um, way in which people are reflecting on um, different technologies, right? Eyeglasses had been in um, use in Europe since the 13th and 14th century, but Galileo is perfecting lenses and, and um, using them to create a telescope, point that at the skies, right? So lenses become associated with Galileo. And you can see the plague doctor who has lenses is wearing the glasses of Galileo. I just want to point out also that the early modern period is a world of symbolic clothing, just in general. You can tell a lot about people by the clothing that they're wearing, and that's really important. So the idea that a physician would wear a particular outfit while taking care of people, treating people for plague, that's just so not surprising to me as somebody who studies this period, right? Cardinals, the color cardinal is like, because of the robes is that, that cardinals in the Catholic Church wore. Those fancy outfits that the Swiss Guard wears, if you've been to the Vatican, you see the Swiss Guard all decked out outside the entrances to the Vatican. Those are designed by Michelangelo in this period. They're meant to convey particular messages. The Red Cross um, fumigators, so these are the people who would burn, um, infected clothing or mattresses during times of plague. Fumigators wagons had red crosses on the front of them. Like might resonate for you all a little bit, but just, just to point out that there are all these symbols that people are wearing constantly. And I think that we should interpret this plague um, doctor's outfit as part of this world of symbols that, that clothing takes on. And I, I mean, just one more example, very briefly, the Ottoman Sultan Suleiman, uh, the Magnificent had uh, a portrait of himself made wearing basically a papal tiara. So like this is, the papal tiara is not an Ottoman symbol and yet he's trying to communicate through his clothing to a European audience, his own prestige. Like these are the kinds of moves that people are making constantly in this period to communicate things about themselves. And I think we should understand the plague um, doctor's costume as part of that or the plague doctor's outfit as part of that. So then when do we get the beak? The costume gets developed around 1619 um, by this guy named Charles Delorme. And it, that was, it was then required in Rome during the 1656 outbreak of plague, which killed about, um, I think, half a million people between Rome and Naples in that year. Um, and you'll see this written up all over the internet. <laughs> falsely as being some as being a picture of a medieval plague doctor that's absolutely not true like the the beak in this costume doesn't come up until the 17th century and when it does so i want you to realize that this image that we're seeing here this is satirical this is dr schnabel von rome um which is basically like german for like dr beak from rome that people are mocking this costume uh, at the same time or poking fun at the of the cost uh, at poking fun at the costume at the same time um, that it's being used. And this is a satirical element. He would have certainly worn a stick, and we'll talk about that, but that's about, about keeping distance again from his patients, but it wouldn't have had an hourglass at the end <laughs> with wings, right? Like that's about a symbol of your own mortality. You can see him also in the background, some people running away from him. And I want to get at this idea of fright a little bit, the ways in which this costume um, communicates for many people fear 
of the death that follows from having to interact with a plague doctor, not because the doctor himself is inherently um, terrifying, but that the disease that he represents and when he shows up with this full costume uh, in, instigates terror. This is an example of a mask itself. This is from Germany or Austria. This is a, um, from the 17th century. You can see the beak again. You can see the lenses embedded. Um, and this is a hood, right? It's not the whole costume. So you can imagine that it would have been worn over a leather outfit, an, another leather robe or a waxed, um, a waxed robe. Um, this is leather, which is interesting. So it's a different kind of material than wax cloth. And I want to look at the parts of the outfit a little bit. This is from a 17th century uh, drawing of the plague doctor. And just to point out again that it's covering the whole body and that's important. They're trying to prevent um, plague from sticking to the whole body. So the whole robe, it's got a hat. Everybody's wearing hats and have head coverings in this period. So that's not entirely surprising. The stick to keep a distance, the gloves to cover the hands. These, these are things that might sound um, unsurprising to us that lots of people put on gloves to go into the grocery store now. You see people wearing gloves walking down the streets. This is part of um, medical attire also in this period. And just to wrap up um, briefly, I found this for the first time. I'd never seen this uh, particular image before and became very interested in it, which is, it's a coat of arms from the 17th century, uh, probably belonging to Theodor Zwinger III, who's a Basel famous he comes from a fam famous family of Basel physicians. And I just want to point out that he's like, he's the one who's got the big rough and the big poofy hat on one side of the coat of arms, but there's also this plague doctor. And again, the full body costume, you can see the lenses, he's holding the stick to keep the distance, he's got the hat on. And I'm not convinced that this is meant, that it's inherently fearful, that we've like, we've represented these um, costumes as sort of as terrifying. And I'm not convinced that the outfit itself needs to be considered terrifying. And we keep seeing this come up again and again, how people are talking about it. I think it's the way that the costume becomes affiliated with the disease, um, the fear of outbreak. Um, that is what is inherently scary. And I, I just wanna sort of separate those two things when we think about um, what it is that masks communicate, what it is that costumes communicate and how we think about that in terms of uh, distant history. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. That's really a, a great foundation for the remainder of the session. Now um, we'll turn to Dr. Gawande. Great. I can't wait for the Q&A where I got to ask why the beak? <laughs> um, we'll, 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 we'll come back to that. Should I say that? I'm so sorry. Sure. I, I like didn't add it to my slide because it was so obvious to me and I meant to and I talked about my asthma. Hey. Say Maybe it. I'll just add it really quickly. The herbs, I meant to say the herbs, you stuffed the nose with good smelling herbs and that changed the scent. So again, like this is combating these terrible smells. I'm so sorry, I just completely left it off. Yes, you're supposed to be replacing the sort of sense of death, the sense of disease that people thought could infect you with a bunch of sweet smelling herbs that you'd stuff in the nose piece. So thank you so much. <laughs> I want, I want a mask with a beak now. Like, you know, if I showed up in the operating room, would, would, would that work? <laughs> we could make that happen, probably, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, in yeah. order to talk... Go ahead, Alan. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, just put bleach and disinfectant in the, in the yeah. um, beak now, and you'd be all set. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, in order to talk about masks in our modern plague, um, the, uh, I think we need to talk about how SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted and then, and then come around to what, we're, what we've ended up doing. Um, unlike SARS-CoV-1, the SARS epidemic that had occur occurred a, a decade ago, um, environmental transmission turns out to account for a very small percentage of cases. We didn't know that in February and March, but we now know it seems to be 6% or less of cases are transmitted from surfaces, picking it up um, uh, through uh, fomites. The spread is primarily, we now know, through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or even just talks. Mostly, it's transmitted through large droplets that get expelled and which mostly do not transmit beyond six feet, hence the social distancing um, uh, admonition. However, under the right conditions, temperature, humidity, 
a close space with poor air circulation, um, a person with a high viral load, coughing and then sneeze or sneezing or even just shouting can propel a cloudburst of respiratory droplets over 20 feet away. Um, an oddity about the virus is that many people will not end up passing it along, despite all of that. Tracing programs have found that 60 to 90% of people who live with an infected person never get infected. And, the, uh, and yet you can have a particular person in the right setting, a crowded bar, a workplace, they can end up infecting scores of others. There's an infamous case of the Skagit Valley Corral practice at a church in Washington state where an infected member arrived uh, for practice who didn't have any symptoms when, when she first came, but she became sick in the course of the three hour long practice um, and ended up leaving before the end. 52 of the 60 choir members ended up falling ill. 32 of them were able to be tested and were confirmed positive despite being you know, 20 feet or more away in many cases. Two of the people died. One of the interesting aspects of this virus and its transmission is um, uh, its dispersal co coefficient, which is a measure of um, how many people it takes to infect, to drive the spread. And in SARS-CoV-2, 80% of transmissions have turned out to be caused by 10% of the cases. So what, we're, what we don't know is that whether this is because it's only a subset of people that are prone to spread, or is it that everyone spreads, but it's only in brief eruptions, like, a, like the geyser at Yosemite, or what is it, Yellowstone? <laughs> um, complicating matters, infectivity, starts before people have symptoms. 40% of it transmission therefore has ended up coming from asymptomatic people. And that's a stark contrast with SARS-CoV-2. The earlier SARS coronavirus, you um, didn't transmit until you'd had symptoms for a week. So you could easily identify people who had symptoms, you could isolate them and manage to control the disease without need of masks or, um, or other measures like that. You mainly relied on people being recognized from symptoms, putting them into an isolation and managing to stop the spread in that way. So when you put it together, this is a virus that is transmitted primarily by respiratory droplets, often before a person knows they're infected and sometimes at a long distance. Masks, have not generally been part of the, were not part of the armamentarium with the last SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. Um, but the dynamics of uh, this particular SARS-CoV-2 um, have made it so distancing and hand-washing were not sufficient to uh, stop transmission. And therefore masks have turned out to be extraordinarily effective. CDC and WHO, taking their cue from the previous SARS coronavirus epidemic, were late to recognizing, and actually quite resistant to recognizing that, um, that masks could be important. Uh, partly, and I think wrongheadedly, um, CDC and WHO were concerned that the access to masks not drain the supply from healthcare facilities. Um, but I think that ended up creating uh, confusion and uh, as well as distrust in, uh, in the uh, judgment that masks would turn, turn around and become something that public health officials were promoting. The primary value of a mask is source control, which is to say it blocks you if you're infected from expelling respiratory droplets uh, to others. I protect you. And if you wear a mask, you protect me. There is now much more evidence that the wearer also gains protection when they have a, uh, a mask. The mask type matters. The N95 mask is most effective 
surgical masks are the next level of effectiveness. They're more effective than the multi-layer cloth mask, which is more effective than a single layer mask. Surgical masks like these, it's hard to believe they can be so effective. They look like you know a couple pieces of tissue paper tied together with strings, but it turns out that the way they work is they're made from a polypropylene fiber. If you look under the microscope at them, it looks like cotton candy, sort of a non-woven uh, plastic. And that, that cotton candy-like um, set of openings allow you to breathe quite freely through the mask, um, more comfortably than with cloth masks. Um, so then how could that possibly be effective? And it turns out the, the important way in which they work is that an electrostatic charge is applied to that um, polypropylene fiber uh, using something ironically called a corona charger. And the static electricity that is created captures viral particles the way that a blanket in the dryer will catch socks. Um, just the virus sticks to it, unless you get the mask wet or, um, or inactivated in a variety of ways. N95 masks are made from the same material, but they have two differences. They're made to have a very tight fit. And so here is my N95 mask for work. And it's made to have a very tight fit and put a seal around your respiratory passages. And it is made with a stronger electrostatic charge so that it is assured to prevent 95% of, par of uh, viral particles uh, from, of airborne particles from passing through. There are masks, and I don't have one. You'll see them around. They'll have a button on them that have a valve. Um, people buy them because it allows you to breathe freely. I, that, I, they are evil masks <laughs> because basically they allow you to breathe out. It's a valve that has a one-way passage so you can breathe out but, um, uh, but you're protected breathing in. So it's more like, I infect you, I protect me. And some cities have banned it. We, we ought to ban them in the US. They were originally created for coal miners and others where the main aim was preventing dust getting into their system. But at this moment in time, the main reason for valve masks um, is the epidemic and they are continuing to be sold. We um, first, really started bringing masks in for the coronavirus uh, in our hospital systems. Um, you know, we've largely ridiculed the Asian experience where um, in Japan and in China, you had high rates of mask wearing by the public. But in late March, you started seeing hospitals, including my own, um, make, a, make a major shift to universal masking that is requiring their staff to all wear masks and then added having all patients in the hospital or in the medical center wear masks. At the, at the time, at least the week that hospitals started doing it, um, it was highly controversial. I'd written an article advocating for it, and I heard you know, very negative things from infection control officers around the country saying, you're gonna make us have to buy this, we're not gonna have supplies, that we're not gonna have enough. But they turned out to dramatically reduce cases and the supplies were able to be scaled up. Um, and, uh, and we've had, uh, and it's been probably the most important component of a multi-component regimen that has been effective in keeping US hospitals from becoming a source, the major source of transmission that they were in the early stages in China and uh, then in Italy, and then in Spain. We've had success in the US, Europe, and Latin America with achieving some degree of mask wearing. The US is actually not bad on the whole. Mask wearing is now at 70% nationwide. But, but uh, and in fact, if we wear masks at about 70% um, and use masks that are at least 60% effective, you don't have it below your nose, you have it properly fitting, um, that would stop the pandemic. But the reality is it's been highly variable. Massachusetts is at 80%. Louisiana is at 60%. North Dakota and South Dakota are right now, this week, the fastest spread in the world. But 
their mask wearing is just 40%. Likewise, Europe has had a substantial spike in cases and they're similarly only at 50% on average in mask wearing and they've been very slow to mandate masks. So what I'd say is we have enormous evidence and some experience with success with mask wearing. Places that are wearing masks, whether it's countries or states, are having some of the best success in returning to otherwise somewhat normal life and controlling the pandemic. Um, but um, we have a variable experience in achieving it. And I think some of that is what Julia will get to talk about. That's great. Thanks so much, Dr. Gawande. It's, it really is fascinating hearing the, um, the disparities in mask use within the United States. I have to say, I would have assumed because people have praised Western Europe in terms of its response, that there would be higher levels of mask wearing than, than you've just, you know. Yeah, they're um, better at testing and tracing. They've done a very good job with mostly testing and tracing and they were early to shut down crowded spaces. But mask wearing has been, been relatively low. Well, let's turn to Dr. Marcus now because obviously one of the fascinating aspects of this is that there's considerable scientific and medical evidence of mask efficacy at this point, and yet it remains the, perhaps the most contentious debate, um, especially here in the United States about its use. So, Dr. Marcus. Thank you. Uh, let me just pull up a few pictures here. And can I get a thumbs up that you guys can see this? All right. So how did we get here, I think is the question. So when we think about any new public health intervention, even something like seat belts, there's always resistance. To some extent, this kind of um, debate about masks is nothing new. This is, um, this is what public health does. We have a need for a new intervention. It's not popular. We have to message around that. But I think there is something kind of unique about what's happened with masks during COVID where it has become not just something that people don't really wanna do and have to be encouraged to do, but actually it's become a political statement and it's highly visible. So it's not the only thing that's been politicized during COVID. Many things have been politicized, hydroxychloroquine, um, Sweden, I mean, every, you name it. Like there's so many things that you can't, you can't even say herd immunity without somebody yelling at you. But, um, but this, I think, it, because it is so visible, um, it, it, it has become, I think, a statement of political ideology that makes it much harder for public health professionals to do their job in terms of messaging. And I, I think we can point to, um, <laughs> to this headline, this story, as one of the drivers of this politicization, not the only one. Um, you know, there, as Dr. Gawande talked about, there, there was some confusion, confused messaging, I think, around masks that uh, created some distrust. But the, the moment that the CDC said, okay, we're, we're going to change our recommendation here and advise cloth, cloth masks to the public, in that same moment, our president undermined that public health recommendation. And I think that um, it, that catalyzed what we then saw as this deep polarization around masks. So this table is looking at attitudes and behaviors related to COVID and it's broken down by Democratic and, Re and Republican Party and by gender. And there's a pattern here where you can see that for all these different protective behaviors, Republican men have the lowest adherence to each, each behavior. And we see that for masks in both, in both indoor settings and outdoor settings when people can't socially distance. And to some extent, this is not surprising in terms of gender, because in general, men engage in protective health behaviors somewhat less than women do. But I don't think we always see this stark divide politically. I think this is a bit different. And I want to tell a little story here um, through this example of Aubrey Huff, who's a former Major League Baseball player. And, and this is one of many, many examples, but this is kind of what what this opposition looks like. He says, and he, by the way, in his um, Twitter bio says he proudly supports toxic masculinity. He says, I will no longer wear a mask inside any business, unconstitutional to enforce. Let's make this bullshit stop now. Who's with me? This was in mid-June. And, you know, he got a lot of um, 
people sharing this and, and supporting it, but he also had a huge pile on of people yelling at him, shaming him, saying, you're a terrible person, you're a grandma killer, which like, I'd be happy to never hear that phrase again. I've heard it so many times in the last six months. Um, you're selfish, you know, just really widely shamed. And he actually dug in his heels. And a couple of days later, he posted a video where he said, take your coronavirus mask and stick it away, then live in fear and wear a mask. And he actually acknowledged, I, I, you know, he said, I understand that this is about protecting vulnerable people and I don't care, they should just stay home. So what I thought was most interesting about this video was that he's wearing a seatbelt which of course is more about protecting yourself than it is about protecting other people, whereas masks, um, you know, they may protect us to some extent, but they seem to be more about protecting other people. But it does suggest he's not immune to public health advice. The dudes who won't wear masks, and really, you know, it's not obviously not just men, and it's not just conservative men, but this does seem to be kind of a pattern that I wanted to acknowledge. And I wrote from my um, experience as an HIV prevention researcher, where we know that shaming is an ineffective approach to health. And the reason is that public health works best when it recognizes and supports people's needs and desires without judgment. And that's actually, it's not a, st a strong statement in a vacuum, but it turns out to be quite a strong statement when you frame it around Aubrey Huff and this kind of politicized opposition to masks, which I think that health professionals have a very hard time empathizing with. I think it's much easier to imagine somebody coming into your, your office, your, your doctor's office saying, I, I'm really struggling to wear condoms, doc, can you help me? Versus, I don't want the government to control me, COVID is a hoax. You know, those, those are, I think, a tough place um, to, to meet people where they are. But I argued that we should. And the reason is that shaming is toxic to public health. It, further polarizes people, and it actually drives them away from public health efforts. It doesn't deter risky health behavior for the most part. What it makes people wanna do is take that behavior where people aren't gonna see it. And that actually makes it harder for public health to address. And I wanna give some examples of what the shaming messaging looks like. And again, I'm gonna use Twitter, and I'm gonna give de-identified examples from health professionals who have tens or even hundreds of thousands of followers. I think mask wearing at this press conference is a reasonable litmus test for whether or not you're a callous moron. Just ran four, four miles in a KN95 mask and I'm not hypoxic. You know why? Because I'm a goddamn American. Real Americans don't whine like a bunch of little snowflakes. Can you imagine being so insecure that wearing a mask for a little while is a threat to your masculinity? Hashtag wear a damn mask. How many times do I need to remind you that this pandemic ain't over? So the frustration and anger that these health professionals are feeling, I think is very understandable, especially because many of them see patients, they see COVID patients. But this kind of messaging is not going to make people wanna put on a mask. And it's also not the kind of messaging that we would imagine using in a doctor's office for somebody who um, you know, was struggling with an eating disorder or again with condoms. I mean. It, I think that this messaging is coming out in the context of an emotional um, response to COVID that's very understandable, and also in the context of this politicization where it becomes much more difficult to understand somebody's oppositional point of view. So I think an alternative is, is compassion. It, even though it can be harder in this politicized context to, um, to draw on that, I think it's what builds trust, and trust is the foundation of successful public health. So some examples from mass campaigns, these are videos from California. Here's former Governor Jerry Brown saying, look, nobody wants to wear these things. And this is a very minor um, statement, but it makes a huge difference. And, and it actually, I think, took months before anybody in public health or any elected officials said, we get it, we don't wanna do this either. And, and that's the reality, nobody wants to wear masks. And once you acknowledge that, people are much readier to hear what else you have to say. They also acknowledge the ways that Masks impede social interaction, muffled laughs, and hidden smiles. And this is a, a, a real concern. Instead of dismissing it as people whining, you know, this should be so easy. I, I do this all day in the ER. Why can't you do this? Um, I, I think this is a way of saying, look, we get it. You have been deprived of social contact for months, and we're asking you just to, to put up this barrier that can, continues to, to get in the way of that social connection. And, and here's why we still think it's important. And then finally, instead of dismissing this concern about masks being a sign of weakness, 
Um, they actually had former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who we all still think of as the Terminator, saying this is not about being weak, or at least my generation thinks of him as the Terminator. And finally, I'll just say, after writing that piece for The Atlantic, I was contacted by many men, many dudes who didn't want to wear masks, and, um, and many of them wanted to talk to me. And so I said, sure, I'll, I'll have these conversations with you. And one of them ended up talking to Vox shortly thereafter. Um, and he had been sending messages to his community saying, don't wear masks. They're trying to control you. This is all a hoax. And by the end of our conversation, he'd really changed his mind. And he felt like that it, I had showed compassion and I didn't condemn him. And so again, it's not, um, it's not always easy to do that, nor are one-on-one -on -one conversations scalable. But I think when we really try to focus on meeting people where they are, no matter who they are, and no matter how much we disagree with them, we end up being much more effective public health professionals. So I'll stop there. And I, I want to just end with these words from Dr. Bonnie Henry, who's the provincial health officer in British Columbia, who has been a paragon, I think, of empathetic public health communication throughout this pandemic. She's been saying, um, consistently, be calm, be kind, be safe. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Marcus. This is really fascinating. And, you know, I have to say, listening, I really agree with you that I think that public health messaging that doesn't try to understand the problem and address it generally with an individual um, almost always fails. That said, I wonder if this is like other forms of harm reduction and shaming. You know, it's not just like, you know, the incredible hostility to gay people earlier, early in the HIV pandemic. Here you have a deep political ideological divide. So on the one hand, you know, those of us who would advocate masks, you know, could say, well, we shouldn't shame those folks. But at the same time, you have the president of the country shaming people who do wear masks. So in some ways, this, I guess one of the questions for us is how well does this fit traditional notions of, you know, if somebody is a, has questions about vaccine and you're seeing them in the office and you could talk to them about their hesitancy and really try to address it. But has this taken on some dimension that really no longer reflects like, you know, I'm shaming somebody or I think of them in a subordinated way, I'm stigmatizing them, that it has erupted into something that, you know, can't be handled by our traditional public health communications approaches. So I'll start with that question and but then we'll open it up in a second. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. And I will say using the word harm reduction in this context is not quite right in the sense that harm reduction is actually, it's a movement for social justice and protection of, of people who use drugs. But I think it has some important um, tenets that are, are, I think, still applicable here in the sense that it is about meeting people where they are. And when we really think about what is going on for somebody who believes COVID is a hoax, who um, doesn't want the government to control them, or whatever the reasons may be around opposition to masks, they are getting their information from somewhere, and they have a president who they're looking up to. It, when, it's not a surprise that there are people who feel this way. And dismissing them is not going to get them to wear a mask. It just isn't. Shaming them is not going to get them to wear a mask. So I hear you that the, it sounds like what you're suggesting is the power dynamics are different here, the politics are different. How can we, it, does, it, does this approach really apply? And I would say, yes, it is different, but also, yes, it still applies. And when I had those conversations with these guys who called me, it was fascinating because it didn't actually take that much to, to build trust in these brief conversations and to hear where they were coming from. So for example, one of them really felt like this was an infringement on his civil liberties that he had to wear a mask. And by taking that value and showing him how he was infringing on other people's civil, civil liberties, people especially in, let's say, crowded indoor settings who could not move away from him, especially people who are working in those settings who have no choice but to be there. 
I think giving him that, that way of thinking about, oh, this is something that's important to me, and now I see how it's relevant here, not just for me, but for the people around me, um, then he said, oh, yeah, I, I guess I see that. I, don't, I shouldn't be infringing on the liberties of this person who's working in the grocery store. And, and another thing that I think is helpful is being a little bit less absolutist. So, you know, there's a tendency when we polarize, we have people, let's say, on the left um, saying, we need to wear masks at all times outside of our houses. But like, let's be real, you don't need to wear masks when you're out, you know, just walking down the street. But that's the direction we have headed in some cases with, you know, the, at some point, this is no longer true, but um, Joe Biden at, at one point was saying, I'm gonna have a national mask mandate that requires masks outdoors at all times, you know, and it's that further polarizes people. So when you actually say, here's where masks matter the most, and you make that ask smaller, people are much readier, I think, to engage. So I do think there's some of these strategies from harm reduction that we can borrow to say, how can we inch people towards something that's lower risk by meeting them where they are? That's a very compelling answer. Let me turn it to Ingrid and we'll open it up for students to come on and ask questions. I think there will be a lot of great questions today. Um, thank you all so much. That was incredibly thought provoking. I have so many questions at so many levels, but maybe I'll just ask one of all three of you. Um, and then we'll have our students come on. You know, as a physician myself, and I have the great fortune of working in the same hospital as Dr. Gawande, and we all benefited from the steps that the hospital took to bring in universal masking within that context. I also recognize um, the challenges, and I think um, Professor Marcus brought this up in terms of the historical ramifications of the cost and the fear. And I think, unfortunately, also in this context, we had a moment, particularly during uh, one of the earlier surges in the pandemic, where we really had to separate family and loved ones from patients in our hospital. And as healthcare providers, it's um, a deeply challenging moment to be communicating with patients with a lot of gear on. Um, I think a lot of us really um, feel the importance of the human connection that we have. And the more gear you put between you and a patient, the more distance they may feel. So the beak I found so fascinating because that really shows the distance and also the fear. And so I wonder, we have a historian, a physician writer, leader, an epidemiologist who's also a writer. Um, all three of you have thought about this from all these different angles. And I wonder, how do you reflect on particularly that moment that that challenge and the interface with the healthcare system and patients as they're coming in. And this concept of the mask, which is symbolic for protection, but also for fear. And then you layer on top of that what Dr. Marcus said about all of the political challenges that we face. I just wanted to see if you could reflect briefly on that in, from your respective fields. And maybe we'll start with Professor Marcus. Maybe we can go around in the order that you started. It's so hard. I've been thinking so much about when plague comparisons are helpful and when they aren't. Um, as somebody who studies plague and is now living in a different pandemic, I mean, when, when we talk about plague, people like half of a population of a city is in a, a given city is dying during an outbreak. This like the scale of death is incredible and the inability for physicians to really make any difference at all in what's happening to many patients is like difficult for us to appreciate. And so I think that that's part of how um, physicians become tied up in this like satire of the fearful mask that like when the physician arrives, he's got the stick that's got like the ticking time, um, what's that called? Timer, sand, where the sand goes down, hourglass, there we go. Hourglass, that's your life trickling away, right? Like the, the symbolism is there for a reason. And I think that there's like, when we think about what the layered symbolisms are of masks in our world right now and the ways that those are being politicized, I think that there's a lot to be said about how people are relating to expertise, like the expertise of a physician right now, and a sort of 
um, antagonism toward expertise in addition to an antagonism toward um, the mask itself and being told that they should be wearing it. So I think that like when, when you get it, like what, what these symbols are doing and why they resonate in different ways for people, I think that that can allow you to unpack sort of what's really going on. Because like the plague doctor shares very little in common with the doctors that I'm getting to speak with right now. Um, like the level of inefficacy, I think is really terrifying. And so when you think about sort of what the comparisons are, they think the disease comparisons are less helpful than the social and public health um, dimensions when we think about what we can learn from plague. I think it's really interesting thinking about places where it isn't politicized. So in the hospitals, it's not really politicized. People fully expect that the clinicians will be wearing masks, that they will be asked to wear masks. And it's interesting to me that that is the case. It's also true that even in countries where you have relatively low mask use, it's not politicized. In Europe, for the most part, it is low mask use because it's not been mandated. People haven't pushed it, but it's not been one party against the other. And there's a, there's a moment in this that makes me think it really has a lot to do with Donald Trump deciding to attack masks. And that was that um, we complied with the lockdowns on both sides of the political spectrum in large part because there was a week in late March where Donald Trump said, holy cow, 2 million people could die and people really should stay home. And you had lockdowns happen widely. Now, it was only a week. And after a week, he started saying, well, by Easter, we'll be able to stop the lockdowns. And then we got a really, you know, the north-south divide um, and a lot moving in that direction. And he seemed to see advantage in, um, you know, he really, has, his mode of, of command is um, divide and conquer and more than bring everybody together and pull them in the same direction. And, uh, and you know, that moment when he had everybody come together to lock down, he was quite successful across the spectrum. Um, and I think the, the ridiculing of the mask, the mockery, the unwillingness to do it, and that chance to kind of as he's flinging the mask off, kind of throw it in the experts' faces and show that defiance that has been important to getting the dudes that Julia was writing about uh, fully behind him. Um, that has been uh, a really important element of what's driving this. And whether, uh, a, whether Dem a Democrat wins or not in the next election, it will continue to be a political flashpoint in the United States in a way that, that um, it just isn't in other places. There's pushback in the UK, for example, as Boris Johnson starts contemplating a mandatory mask policy, but, um, but it's not strictly divided across those lines. Maybe I'll just add one thing quickly. Um, I think in some ways, you know, even putting aside for a second the politicization, um, I want to just go back to the, the um, question about how this interferes with social connection and why we should, why I think that should be an important consideration for public health. So, um, you know, thinking about why, you know, in a hospital, people are much more willing, I think, probably to um, put on a mask. They expect it, they expect their doctor to be wearing it. But when we're out at the park, it's a bit different, right? I mean, these are very different contexts. And so even for people who are not a part of it's challenging. Um, and I think that that's something that we should take into consideration when we um, think about what kind of policies we want to create around masks. I think um, we should try to, to wear and, and give them breaks in, in settings where it doesn't matter. I'm getting a message that my internet is unstable, so I don't know if I've been like frozen this whole time, but. You were frozen um, for, a, for a 30 seconds there. <laughs> oh, sorry. It was great, it was brilliant, you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are 
and we could talk for much longer, but thank you. And we're going to bring in some students. Do we have, Ivan, do we have a student who sure. wants to ask a question? Uh, we'll do a TFS question, uh, then I'll bring on our first video ask. Uh, this is from one of our students. We've talked a lot about the medical distrust that leads a lot of people of color to say that they won't get a vaccine if it becomes available. In the same vein, do we see a variance in mask usage between different races and ethnicities? Uh, or is should probably be, is there someone, uh, or is where someone lives more significant in mask wearing than race and ethnicity? Julia, you, you had some of the data on that. I wonder if you want to mention, you want to take it. That. Yeah, I mean, I think mask, from what I've seen, um, mask use is lower among um, white people in general than among people of color, and it does vary by geography, but I don't think I could, I don't think we have data to help tease out um, kind of confounding there, you know, they're, they're, if people who are white are more likely to be Republican, is it more about the, the political leaning versus the race ethnicity question, but I think this is an important um, point about medical distrust um, and, and how this is all playing out by race ethnicity. And I think people who, people of color in this country, particularly black people, have been much more affected by COVID and are much more likely to know somebody who has died or been sick. And so that, that itself may drive mass use. I think the only thing I'd add to that is that um, I think that there's not surprisingly high levels of distrust in the vaccine as it becomes as as the process of approval gets politicized, and you know, until you've seen data around what the vaccine really is doing, I think that leadership figures are going to play a very important role once a vaccine gets approved. You know, do we see uh, local hospitals, um, group leaders coming in and saying? I believe it. It's safe. It's effective. I'm getting my va I'm getting my vaccination, and um, and I think you should too. Do we see religious groups? Do we see um, uh, a variety of others coming forward? Those will be important to mobilizing the different communities in polio eradication, where there's been you know strong um, uh, opposition in Muslim communities. It's been essential that Rotary has been part of the um, uh, the global rollout, because Rotary has local members who have ended up supporting, you know, whether it's in northern Nigeria or in Afghanistan or in Pakistan, public messaging and very, very local messaging that we ought to do this. And it's not a campaign to sterilize Muslim boys. This is, this is a, you know, there are all kinds of rumors that flowed with polio, but it the experience with polio completely validates what Julia was saying. There will all there was always some villagers who, even in the midst of a polio outbreak, would refuse vaccination, and it was very evident that you only ended up foam, fo forming um, uh, fueling the uh, rumors and the um, conspiracy mill when you forced people to get um, vaccines. Uh, or, or you know, in the same way as with masks. And getting to global eradication has succeeded by not forcing communities to have it uh, be mandatory. I think this raises a really critical point for thinking about the future of public health and public health messaging. Because on the one hand, national messaging, Trump or a national leader can have a giant impact. But on the other hand, one of the things we've learned and learned from HIV and other public health crises is that local community messaging, messaging that's networked among peers often has a tremendous effect. And it seems to me that the, you know, cultural division around masks makes that of course much more difficult. But in communities, in churches, if there was a closer notion of I'm doing this for the people around me and for myself, we might have been much more successful. Obviously, there have been incredible political and ideological attachments that have made this so problematic. But I think what you're really saying about polio has a certain kind of application potentially as we think forward. And, you know, the other thing about masks is they're imperfect. And 
you know, we have a tendency to think in biomedicine, either this totally protects me and it ends the pandemic or it, it doesn't. And it's very hard in this harm reduction mode of partial benefit to communicate as effectively as we probably do need to looking ahead. So there are issues of risk and scientific information and literacy under this as well. Yvonne, um, do you have a student who would like to ask a question? <laughs> 